I started by talking about us in saying that that we've been thinking of objects since we were kids. Like our uh, family members are usually pointing out objects like a fire truck or an ambulance or, or the hot rod or the motorcycle or the Harley. So we're thinking in objects. We just, we really not had, had to use it, right? And unless you come into programming and then you are exposed to object-oriented programming or if you are in business and then you are exposed to object thinking. But other than that, like we just kind of take it for granted. I mean, we, we don't even think about it. So let me see here. Uh, so we know now, oh, so that's why it's called object-oriented programming because we are thinking of things which are nouns. So yes, that is why it's called object-oriented programming. But don't think about programming right now, right? Let's just understand why it's object-oriented. So when we are programming with objects, then this objects here can perform actions. Like the fire truck has a siren, so it makes a noise. The ambulance can has a siren and makes a noise. So does a patrol car make a noise? So it can perform actions. They can also have actions performed on them. Like uh, the firefighters wash the truck, they keep it clean, they maintain it, they set up whatever equipment they need on them. So do the ambulance guys, or maybe they have someone designated to, to keep it clean for them. But somebody, meaning some other object, uh, can uh, perform object, uh, actions on an object, right? Like this example. Okay, how about a different example, right? So, so we're talking about vehicles, but now let's bring it into maybe like academia. Like if we have a grade book, then it can print, if it's an object, right? If this is an object and somebody wrote code, then it could print uh, grades for students, right? And then a professor can record grades. So how do we make so how do we make the transition from these examples right here or from, from these concepts to programming? So what are we doing here? If we say a grade book can print grades, a professor can record grades. We are modeling, we model a domain, in this case, academia. Although, I mean, I only did grade book and professor, but we are modeling a domain with objects. And as we can see, these objects can have actions performed on, on them or they can perform actions. Okay, so how does this happen? Like how, do, how, does, how is this accomplished? So that's the next topic, right? So abstraction, what is abstraction? So if we come back to the grade book, if I'm a professor and I'm an object and I'm looking at the grade book, then I know that I can tell it to print grades or I can record grades. So I don't know the details of how this object was created with code, but I know, hey, I can print grades. 
and then I'm like, uh, or I can uh, record grades. So if I come back over here and uh, show you some code to demonstrate that with code that we've already used, then you'll see that the string and the vector are objects. So we go here and let's look at the example for vectors. So we created a vector of letters, right? And then we called a function pushback. So what is the my view of the vector, the external view? I can say, oh, somebody created an assign. I can I can call add, I can call back, I can call begin, capacity, C begins, VN, clear. Do I know how they implemented assign or how they implemented clear? Well, maybe I have an idea, but I don't know how, how the C++ standard library developers did it. But I know that if I call clear, it'll clear the vector. And if I call pushback, then it'll add an item to the end of the vector, right? So that is the, the abstract abstraction view of a vector. I just get to see it from the outside, the functionality that it has from the outside via its function. So that's what they mean by abstraction, right? So we deal, I know this is straight from the book, right? So actually not this book, it's an object or in a programming book. Dealing with ob the appropriate level of details, which is kind of like what? Maybe this one's a little clearer, right? Focuses on the outside view of an object and separate behavior from implementation. But maybe this one's like the easiest to understand for us. If we look at this code, then I'm like, oh, okay, so pushback, that's like an external view. How did they do it? I don't know, but I know that it works. And uh, let's create an example of encapsulation. And we will go to a bank account example because we'll be writing some code <clears throat> Uh, for classes to create a, a bank account uh, structure. So before I do that, let me go back here. So model a domain with objects. So we can say, oh, okay, so so we have a, a bank account. So I can model a bank account. And then we know that maybe there is a checking account and then there is a savings account and maybe other types of accounts and if i'm a bank customer i might talk to these guys via an atm or maybe a teller object and then i am the customer, right? So, so you see, we're modeling uh, teller teller objects. So, I am thinking in objects. Okay, so I have an account checking savings. I can talk to them via a an ATM account or the teller class, not the ATM account, an ATM object. And if I'm a customer, then I come in, I swap my card <clears throat> in the ATM machine, I type in my PIN, and then it allows me access to get my balance or deposit money or what have you but then the atm object is talking to the savings account it could maybe call a function get uh, balance or if i want to get the balance for my chicken and it, it could call a function get balance right and then it gets those values and then it shows them uh, to the atm the atm sends it to the customer object and the customer object sees the value right so that's what we mean by modeling with objects. So now let's go to a smaller scope and we'll just focus on the bank account object. So we go here. So if we are thinking about a bank account object, then we can use a UML class diagram. And then usually we have the name of the class here. 
we're not talking about code, right? We're just trying to understand objects and how we derive them. So then what is abstraction? The external view of an object. So if I'm the ATM object and I want to talk to the bank account, then I know that I can call get balance with some return value, maybe double, right? So double return. So that's how ATM can talk to the bank account. So meaning the ATM sees, oh, I can call this get balance and it'll do something for me. If I'm a teller object, then how can I talk to the bank account? Yeah, I can get balance, but if I'm a new customer and I want to open a bank account, then maybe the teller can also call open bank account with some parameter here, like for money. I can also uh, deposit some money. And that's how the teller object can talk to the bank account. But this concept right here, where they see the external view of the bank account, meaning all they see is get balance. They don't see how get balance was coded. They don't see how open was coded. They don't see how deposit was coded. All they know is that if they call get balance is going to return some value to them and then they display it to screen. So this right here, right, is an example of abstraction where we model something from the real world, in this case, a bank account, and we give it some actions and the bank account can perform actions or other objects like the ATM and the teller can perform actions on the bank account. Questions here? Let me see. Yes. Yep. Yep. They're objects. Yeah. I, obviously, I didn't put anything here. My main concern is they can perform actions on another class, and we are creating an, an abstraction. And what is an abstraction? So, I mean, can we visually see a bank account? I mean, when we go to the bank, like, like we can't see it, but we can see that it gives us a balance, and it, we put money in there, and then we check the ATM or from online and it shows us balances, right? So so we are taking something that's abstract and we're giving it concrete meaning, meaning we are creating a class and then we are mimicking what it would do in the real world, right? So that's an abstraction. <clears throat> and I know that the definition is kind of like well, dealing with appropriate level of details focuses on the outside view of an object, separate behavior from implementation is kind of like, what? <clears throat> but hopefully with this explanation, then we can see, oh, like somebody like ATM can call get balance, uh, it, Teller can call open, it can de de call a deposit function and what have you. So this right here is an abstraction and Another word is, I mean, I won't ask you this, but you'll see this in data structures, abstract data type. So that's what this class is, like abstract data type. Okay, so that is the first principle of object-oriented programming, abstraction. There's four. We The first two weeks, we'll talk about the first two, and then we'll worry about the next ones, which is uh, inheritance and polymorphism later, once we get enough practice with these concepts. So encapsulation, right? So let's go over here. Uh, encapsulation, var variables and functions in the class. Okay, so what does that mean? Only the object itself has access to its data. Only the object can make changes to its data. 
it hides secrets from other objects. And let's go back and look at this example that we have going here. So if you think about the situation, this object here, then we're like, well, there must be some variable in here, maybe name balance. So when I call get balance, then I get the value that's in that variable balance and it's sent to the ATM. But see, the ATM object does not know that. I mean, we as programmers, we can kind of deduce it. Oh, yeah, I mean, there must be some variables in here. But the ATM object doesn't care. It just knows, hey, give me the balance and I'll do something with it. But if we recreate this as an encapsulation example, then let me go here and bank account. So then maybe there is some variable in here named balance. And then there might be the get balance function here. I'm not going to write the whole return values and all, right? Just to write less. But where does this come from? So if we go back and look at the definition only, oops, let's, let's put, my, put my elbow on the keyboard, sorry. Only the object has access to its data. Okay, so let's understand what that is. Balance, okay, so only the object has access to its data. Can the ATM class directly access balance. Not directly. We are getting the balance indirectly by calling get balance. So here we can see, oh, maybe they're saying return balance, but ATM cannot directly access or modify balance. So that holds true for this, right? Only the object has access to its data. Only the object can make changes to its data. Okay, so what does that mean? So if I come back here and then I'm like, okay, so then deposit and then I accept some double value and teller, or maybe ATM can also call deposit, right? Nowadays we can deposit from the ATM. So the ATM calls deposit so it's implicitly changing balance we can more or less conclude here oh the deposit or maybe that class function has some code in here that makes sure that this is greater than zero this value is greater than zero and if it is then it does balance plus equal amount and then now the balance grows but the atm object didn't directly modify balance the bank account did via this function deposit okay so this is indirectly modifying balance but not directly modifying it we are protecting the balance for the bank account it will only be modified via functions that we provide and we will provide validation and rules that if met then our function will modify <clears throat> it's data. And then finally, hides secrets from other objects. So I asked the question, where does balance come from? Like, like I slide my card in the ATM machine. I type in my PIN number. It has my account number. And so there must be some database where they can the code can send a query with my account number and then return the balance and then my my code <clears throat> the code initializes balance so maybe it has a function named like get 
begin balance or something like that or running balance or whatever. But ATM cannot call that function. This function is called when ATM sends a request to get my records, right? So then there's some code in here for bank account that has my account number. And then the first function that's called when this object is created is get begin balance. So then it sends a SQL query to my database and then it returns the get begin balance. And at that time, balance has <clears throat> the begin value. So that is a secret that the bank account is keeping from other objects because the ATM, I mean, does the ATM care where it gets the balance from? No, the ATM just like, hey, you know, customer XYZ wants to see their balance and bank account's like, okay, let me do some work. All of this happens and then get balance is called and then ATM's like, okay, here, here's your balance customer. So that is what we mean by hide secrets from other objects. Okay, so any questions here? And again, this, these are just concepts. We still have to see how we, we're gonna do this with code, right? Like how do we do this with, with C++ code? So for now, these are just concepts. Okay, so far it's clear, which is good. Okay, so Let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, yes, go ahead. Well, what what they mean with abstraction is like get balance. Like the ATM objects object doesn't know how get balance is created, but it can see it. If we go back to this example, get begin balance cannot call, and if it cannot call it, that means it cannot see get begin balance, right? So, so that's Mm-hmm. How they created, yes. Okay. Okay, so okay. Okay, so now we've been exposed to functions for what four weeks already, and then I had this example here where we're like well these are functions we try to uh, tackle complexity by creating different header files but in the end all of these guys are still functions so if i'm working with functions oops, all these are functions One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Let me create more. Assuming these are functions and assuming that's 20. So which one would you rather work with? Oh, assuming this is 20, I didn't count them, right? So assuming it's 20, 20 functions, or this 20 functions over here, they're functions, but they are class functions. And if there's some, some error here, obviously with test cases, I mean, we can tackle that complexity, 
but which one would you rather work with? Like, do you want to work with with this, or do you think working with this is better? Like, which one do we think would tackle complexity better, right? So then if you're like, well, functions, okay, well, let's multiply it by by 2, right? So 40, multiply this by 2, which is 8. So would you rather work with 8 objects or with 40 functions? And if we multiply it by 3, then do we want to work with 12 objects or with 60 functions? In the end, we are working with 60 class functions and 60 free functions, right? Free because they don't belong to a class. But hopefully you can see that as the code grows, objects are doing what the creators of object-oriented programming intended to, which was help us tackle complexity and understand complexity. So a bug here, so this is a bug. We're working with the whole code, even though the bug is in one function. If there's a bug here, then we're working with one, two, three, four, five. So notice that we narrowed we narrowed the scope. So now if we fix this issue, then then we're okay. Here, like yeah, we fixed this here, but Remember, we're passing parameters left and right with functions all over the place. So even though we might fix the bug here, we still have to do very diligent unit testing to make sure that we did fix the bug, the bug here and that it won't creep up somewhere. Another bug won't creep up over here. Here, yeah, another bug might creep up here, 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 but that's four places as opposed to 19 places here. Right? So that's kind of like what the the creators of object oriented programming were were trying to tackle like the complexity of functions or, or the the issue of maintaining code with lots of functions and they're like well why don't we just narrow the scope down so that programmers who maintain the code you know don't have to like be fearful of modifying extending uh, programs so questions here <clears throat> Yeah, that's what we're trying to do with header files. But even, I mean, right now, like you can't see that because we've been using what maybe two, three functions. But just imagine like creating a program with a lot of functions and eventually the header would be too big. And then what you try to do is group functions that perform like actions, maybe like this example that I have here for uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable, payroll, and general ledger. You're, you're trying to tackle complexity by grouping. Uh, the functions and what we feel is logical header files. But in the end, uh, there's still functions. So maybe this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 40 functions, right? So it's still like free functions and all of these functions require parameters being passed to them. So, so that's why uh, we may run into issues. And if we go back and look at this encapsulation example, yeah, like right here, yes. I mean, we have to pass in a parameter because we're getting some value from the outside. But functions in an object have access to balance. So this can access balance, this can access balance, this can access balance. The three functions here can access balance. Thus, we don't have to pass parameters within the scope of the class, which gives us fewer opportunities to make mistakes. The only time we need parameters is maybe the customer ID from the ATM and uh, uh, incoming uh, deposits or or withdrawals. Other than that, like everything's within here. So we're trying to limit the issue with the issue that we may have with passing parameters all over the place. And recall that I asked here, like who owns who owns the, the data here? Like who owns the data? 
APAR payroll GL? Well, it, it's hard to determine because all of them require functions and functions require parameters being passed in, right? And if we go and look at this example, bank account will own the balance and the customer ID data. All the other functions that belong to other classes can access balance and customer via functions of the class with rules we create. So we're trying to protect the integrity of our data and we're trying to eliminate issues with too many parameters being passed around over functions in our program. So that's what we're trying to do with uh, class classes. And hopefully uh, that's understood. Yeah, so if I come back over here and show you like how the <clears throat> the book was saying, right? So so this is a program with functions and this program works with files, right? So we can see here, uh, get master area, get formatted, um, get master record, get all records. So it's, it's working with files on the hard disk and these are functions. So would you rather work with this or would you rather work with something like this, right? So where we have one, two, three, four, five classes and maybe each class has three or four functions in here or would we rather work with this, right? So that's the whole thing with <laughs> functions and classes, like why we are uh, learning about objects so that we can see that, oh, we can do this. And this is downloadable. Those are, I think I got the information. Yeah, so I have the references, right, from renowned uh, C++, uh, not C++ object uh, oriented experts, right? So. So that's where I got this information from. The book does talk about objects and it, it talks about classes being a blueprint. And then it tells you to like name all the nouns and it's kind of like, really? Like, so I don't, that's why I don't go there. It says like write all the nouns and then eliminate the nouns that don't make sense. And it's kind of like, well, why don't we just identify the nouns that make sense, right? <clears throat> okay, so any questions here? Okay, so we're, we'll learn about the bank account. So now we will write code to introduce the class structure in C++. Make sure there's no questions. Okay. So we go here. Um, I know we, uh, we're creating branches. Uh, so what I do, and I don't know if you've noticed, I don't really create the branches here. Like in Visual Studio Code, you can work with code as long as you don't check it in, you're not damaging anything on GitHub. And then after you write code, you can create the branch on GitHub and then download it and then simply switch to the branch that you want to work with and then check it in and it'll be smart enough to keep everything organized for you. So that's that's why I don't create uh, branches. Okay, so we can say uh, class keyword and then we can say account. I know I said bank account, but I'll just, I'll say account. Open, close, curly brace and semicolon. Make sure you don't forget the semicolon because if you forget it, then C++ will tell you there's an issue, but it won't, it won't actually help that much. So, okay, so let's go back and look at our example. We were saying ATM can call the get balance function. ATM cannot call get begin balance, right? So we'll focus right now simply on get balance and we'll focus on balance on this class variable. Okay, so how do we, uh, how do we limit the access to our classes? Well, we have access specifiers. So public means anything I define below this uh, access specifier can be accessible by 
I'll use uh, integer because I don't have to worry about decimals, right? So now, get balance is accessible if an ATM object exists or from main, we can see get balance. Why? Because we made it public. So we're saying anybody can call my get balance function. And then if I don't want somebody to access something, then I create the private access specifier. And no one can access or no one outside the class can access balance. What do I mean? Okay, so let me go to main here. Include bank account. Before I go there, let me come here to functions. I create function scope in main. I can simply call it. It's ready for me. So I don't have to do anything special. However, for a class, I have to create a, an instance of it in memory, right? So account, account. So notice here, it's a class account. My variable name is account. And if I say account dot, notice now it's telling me that I can call get balance. Just like we did for vector. Now I have to switch to the vector branch. I created a variable or an instance of vector in memory, and now I can use it. And notice that if I say letters dot, then it shows me all the functions that I can use, meaning, oh, this must be public functions in the vector class. So thankfully, the standard library creators did a lot of heavy lifting for us and created a lot, a lot of functionality for us that we can use. So I jump back to my code here, Oops, main here. And now I have the same thing, right? Get uh, balance and balance, right? So now it's kind of like, oh, I thought you said that balance was not accessible. So what happened? So let's see what happens. <clears throat> it displayed it for me, but no, notice that it's telling me that account balance is inaccessible. Why is it inaccessible? Because I don't want anyone outside of the class messing with balance, because then the integrity of the data in account will be compromised, and then I'll, I'll get in valid or incorrect results, right? There's nothing keeping me from making this public, but now I lost control of balance because anybody outside the class can modify balance. And there is no validation. They can put whatever values they want. So this is not desirable. If I want to model a real bank account, then I have to make sure that I control this with access specifiers and make it private. So this right here is how we create a simple class in C++. So we have account, account, and assuming this is in main, we have the stack. The heap and this example is not in play. We're not using that memory. We have the chunk for main. And we have memory addresses here. 
what uh, C++ will do is it'll determine how much memory it needs for class. So it needs at least four bytes. And then within main, we will get a chunk of memory for the account variable. And maybe somewhere in here, we have balance. Uh, what is the value? Whatever number is stored at this address. That's what the value will do. So if we come back here, then I'm like, okay, get balance. So I need to write some code for balance. There's nothing stopping me from simply saying return balance. Notice it lets me access balance from this function. It knows that I am using the balance that belongs to account. Why? Because get balance and balance both live in the account class scope. Okay, that's why I can use balance and I do not have to pass it in as a parameter. Both of these are belonging to the class, so I can use it. The way we code in this and for classes and, and C++ programs is we write the code in the CPP. So what I'll do is I'll copy this here. Bank account CPP. I need to include bank account header. This right here, C++ thinks it's the functions we've been working with up to now, which are free functions. They don't belong to an, to an object. If we want this to belong to the account class, then we have to prefix it with the name of the class and double colon. At that time, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, so, so this is the get balance that belongs to account this one and then we can say yes how about returning balance that's how we do return balance and notice it knows that it's the account balance this balance right here and we go and create a test case for this one So I include bank account. Test account get balance. So I can create an instance of account and then I say require that account get balance hopefully equals to zero. And let's see if that's the case. So what did I do here? I created a test case. I create an instance of account. And then I'm just calling the get balance function. I want to test to see if it's equal to zero. Uh, go to CMake. No kit selected. So let me select the compiler. And uh, let me see if it lets me choose something. Okay, it's configuring. I should get the, okay. So now let me go to test here. Ah, it's building everything. I didn't want it to do that. Cancel. Okay, examples, classes, and let's run it. Run in terminal. So we failed, but that's okay. I actually knew it would fail. So we come back here. That's why I put the question mark here. Like, what is the value of balance? And I stated whatever value is there at the time that address, that memory address is given to us. So the question is, well, how do we make it be zero? 
Okay, so we jump back to the header, bank account header. We can use this special code, open, close, curly brace, zero. That means initialize to zero. And then we can run the test case again or an terminal. And green is good, up arrows, space, dash, s. And notice that get balance is now zero. So this code right here is open, curly brace, zero, close curly brace. That is the code to initialize values. But if we're thinking about the real world, well, they usually have a begin balance. And if we look at our code, let me see, I, I can finish this example. We had get begin balance, but for now, we're not, we're not going there for now. How can we fix this, right? So we are creating another function. We can use the special function that's called a constructor. I'm pretty sure you learned about that in Python. And then I can say int balance. And then I use this special code. And then I can say balance. Which balance? Balance this one. And then I open uh, close parentheses B. Okay, so before I run this program, what going to happen let's trace it so I come back here account and now I'm like okay so your balance will be 100 so now you should be 100 so then 100 comes to our header file finds our special function B is 100 and here we're saying balance you are not zero anymore hey wait a minute how do I know that it's zero because as soon as a class is created, the value with this code is initialized to zero. So for a millisecond, or pro probably less than a millisecond, balance is zero, but then when we say balance, you are now whatever B is, which is 100. Now balance will be 100, and we can prove that by running the test case. And that'll be the last example. And I will open an, a class exercise. That should be easy. You create a stack diagram. Use Microsoft Excel, PDF, Word, whatever you want, doesn't matter. So up arrow, space dashes. So notice it is 100. Okay, so I'll stop here. Let me unlock uh, the class assignment for today. Calendar. So create a class diagram, be as detailed as you can. Uh, available at 6.45. Okay, so once I click Save, it should be available in the calendar.